So what I'll share with you over the next 15 minutes is what I have termed really an evolution in the treatment of breast cancer. And it cannot be termed a revolution because we still have one in 10 women who get diagnosed with breast cancer during their lifetime. We still have 5,300 women who die of breast cancer every year in Canada. And we still have about 24,000 women who get diagnosed with breast cancer every year in Canada. So I think it would be an injustice to all those women, all those patients, all those healthcare workers who are treating, if you call this a revolution, it really is in a step and wise manner or evolution in the treatment of breast cancer. And why breast cancer? I think many of the principles that we will learn in breast cancer, we can apply to many other cancer types. And hopefully what I'm sh able to share with you over the next few minutes is what are those principles that we have learned that are having an impact on the lives of women with breast cancer and will potentially have an impact on the greater number of women with breast cancer and maybe other cancer types as well. So as we take a look at this road of precision medicine, and Dean Meddings and Carla have done a wonderful job in sharing what it is, and from a cancer perspective and from an oncologist perspective, this is what that road looks like. We need to be able to understand the biology. What is it that's driving that cancer? Why did that cancer take place for that particular patient. We need to be able to develop the treatment and tailor our treatment to say, this is the treatment for this disease, and then to be able to individualize it, not just based on the disease, but also based on that patient. And that's where precision medicine comes true. So understanding the biology, designing the right treatment for that patient, and then being able to individualize it based on that particular patient to say you are more likely to benefit because of who you are. So what I'll share with you over the next few minutes is what have we learned and how far have we come along for understanding the biology. So this is a very simplistic way of looking at breast cancer. And breast cancer is not one disease. It's probably hundreds of different types of diseases. And people say, well, why can't we cure cancer? Breast cancer in itself is hundreds of different types of diseases, and cancer at large is many thousands of different types of diseases. So we can't cure everything, but we can start taking pieces of different types of cancer to understand the biology, and then to be able to tailor the treatment and individualize the treatment. So what I'll share with you is one particular subtype of breast cancer that I am actively involved and have been involved is the HER2 type. So there's three main subtypes of breast cancer. There is triple negative, which is about 15% of breast cancer. There's hormone receptor positive, which is the majority of breast cancer that we see, about 60 to 70% of women who, or men who get breast cancer have hormone receptor positive. And HER2 positive, which is about 20% of breast cancer patients that we see. So one in five breast cancer patients will have HER2 positive breast cancer. So the story of this is very interesting. So going back now, 30 years, this is how long it's taken us, 30 years. So the HER2 gene was identified 30 years ago and felt that this contributed to the development of breast cancer and contributed to the development of very aggressive breast cancer in 1984, 30 years ago. Then the scientists at UCLA and Genentech in San Francisco developed an antibody called trastuzumab or Herceptin in 1992. And they felt if we gave this antibody, which is against this HER2 receptor, that blocks this HER2 receptor, and thereby the cancer cells can be targeted. So by 1992, we had an antibody against HER2-positive breast cancer. The problem was, is that in order for this antibody to be effective, even though it was targeted, it had to be given with chemotherapy. So we still had to subject our patients to chemotherapy and the side effects related to chemotherapy, and hence, it was not really a targeted drug. It was a tailored drug, it was a helpful drug, but it was not a targeted drug, because we had to combine the chemotherapy and the side effects with this targeted drug. So what happened? In 1993 to 1996, these scientists at Genentech said, okay, let's do clinical trials under the leadership of Dennis Lehman, who was a wonderful, renowned uh, a researcher, and they started doing the trials. They came to Canada to do these trials because some patients felt that this was so helpful for them that this is really meaningful. They came to Canada, and by 1998, it was shown that patients who got chemotherapy and this drug Herceptin lived longer, 
However, they still needed chemotherapy. And they lived longer with advanced disease, and the patients were living longer. So the question was, if patients had advanced disease and they could live longer, what if we gave this drug earlier to patients after surgery? Can we cure those patients? And the answer was yes. There was about a 30% increase in number of patients who could be cured. But they still had to go through chemotherapy and this drug. So then the concept was, if there is chemotherapy that's needed, and it needs to be synergized with this antibody, can we combine the two and create something which is called an antibody drug conjugate? So what is the principle? The principle is, you need to give chemotherapy, but no, a lot of normal healthy cells die off. We have an antibody that hits the cancer cell. What if we attach the chemotherapy right to this antibody and thereby deliver the chemotherapy right to this cancer cell? That is precision medicine. Can we give chemotherapy that's attached to the antibody goes right to the cancer cell? Well, it makes sense, but will it work? So here's a drug called TDM1 that we got um, involved with in 2007. So we had this antibody Herceptin. We were able to then study this compound because it was connected with this chemotherapy drug, DM1, which is about 200 times more potent than standard chemotherapy. But because it's been combined with this antibody, our hope was that it would go right to the cancer cell and not affect the normal healthy cells. So that was the principle. So here is what happens. This drug comes along. It binds to the cancer cell, this HER2 receptor, which is about 15% of the breast cancer patients. It attaches to this HER2 receptor. It then is taken up right within this cancer cell. And this chemotherapy is released right within the cancer cell. And it attacks the cancer cell directly and supposedly spares the normal healthy tissues. So we had this drug in 2007 with very exciting premise of truly delivering tailored therapy, precision therapy, to HER2 positive breast cancer patients. So we were at Sunnybrook at that time, and we had the opportunity to lead this international trial looking at this drug, TDM1, versus standard chemotherapy and Herceptin. And our hypothesis was, well, it's going to be precise. It's going to go right to the cancer cell. Patients will have less side effects, and maybe it'll be more effective. So we started these trials in 2008. Around the world, there was about 230 centers which were involved in about 26 countries, and we were seeing some amazing results. And I'll share with you the story of this lovely woman, Delaney. Delaney has been featured in many different um, articles in the Globe and Mail and other uh, uh, newspapers. And Delaney was a woman with three kids who had advanced breast cancer. Her cancer had spread. And their survival for Delaney was maybe about two years or so without any effective therapy. She had exhausted what was considered to be standard traditional treatments. And she came to us for participation in this clinical trial where we were randomizing patients to TDM1, this drug versus standard chemotherapy. And Delaney started her treatment and the tumor started melting away. They melted away to the point we did the CT scans and they were completely gone. She had a complete response to this. This was six years ago. Delaney still continues to do well, still plays with her kids, and is still doing well without any significant side effects. That is precision medicine. But the problem was Delaney was one of very few patients who had this amazing response. There were many patients who lived longer. There were many patients who had better uh, side effects. But this drug still had side effects. It could still affect the liver. It could still affect the platelets. But for her, it was the right drug at the right time, at the right moment. So the question is, how can we identify what is it about Delaney? What is it about her cancer that led to this amazing response where she's still alive and well, playing with her girls when some other patients are not? And that is the quest for precision medicine. So what has happened overall? Overall, in HER2-positive breast cancer, we have nearly doubled, tripled, how long patients with advanced HER2-positive breast cancer live. We were able to show that if we offer these therapies to our patients, they live longer, they live better, 
and some of them with less side effects. However, many of them will still die of this disease. Many of them will still have cancer that mutates and cancer that's going to progress. And the question then is, why do we have to wait for cancer to be advanced for us to be able to treat them? Can we treat them early? Can we treat them right when they have breast cancer in the early stages, not in the advanced stages? So how do we precise and how do we offer precision medicine early on? Well, the challenge is the following. In most patients who have breast cancer, this is what we do. We have surgery, and then after surgery, we give them chemotherapy. And after chemotherapy, we may give them radiation and targeted drugs. Well, that doesn't quite make sense because we take away the tumor, and our goal then is to give chemotherapy to target any small cells which are floating around. But we don't really know whether it's working or not because the tumor has been taken away. Well, what if we gave the treatment even before surgery, and we could see if the treatment was working. We could see if the cancer was shrinking even before surgery. Well, what if, instead of giving chemotherapy, we gave targeted treatment before surgery, where the patient would not have to go through hair loss, nausea, vomiting, risk of infection, and we just target the treatment right before surgery? And what if, if we send the patients to surgery, there's no more cancer cells left? So this is really switching our mindset. Instead of thinking that as soon as we see cancer, we have to go and rush into surgery and then give the treatment afterwards, well, what if we step back and understand what is it that's making that tumor grow, which we call biomarkers, which we call cancer drivers? What is it that's making the treatment grow? Now, what if we give a total targeted approach? And what if with this total targeted approach without chemotherapy, if the patient goes through surgery, there's no cancer cells seen. Well, what we know, if that's the case, these patients do really well. The challenge is, how do we change the dogma? And how do we reverse the sequence so we can start offering targeted treatments earlier and earlier? And what if we had a way of measuring and imaging if the tumor melt cells were melting away, and these patients didn't even have to go through surgery. That is precision medicine, and that is what the future of HER2-positive breast cancer will look like. And that's why we are here to advocate for clinical trials and clinical research to see if we can not only improve the outcomes and cure patients and make patients live longer, but do so with less side effects, more precision, and better therapies. So that is the principle of precision medicine. Characterizing the tumor biology, in this case the HER2 positive, developing the right treatment, in this case drugs like Herceptin or TDM1, and then being able to individualize a treatment to offer it to those patients who really need it and who are precise. But the road doesn't end with HER2 positive breast cancer, it begins. And the next chapter cannot take us 30 years to write that story. It has to be much shorter, it has to be much quicker, and it has to be more precise. So here is a list of many other targetable mutations that have been identified in breast cancer. And we can't wait 30 years for each and every one of these targetable mutations. As Dean Meddings mentioned, we're not able to sequence cancers, so we know exactly what those targetable mutations are. What if we sequence these cancers and match them with the right treatment? And that is the premise of precision oncology. Here is just a list of many different mutations which have been identified in breast cancer that we are trying to better understand to better able to tailor our therapies. But what else is missing? We are focusing on the tumor. So the road to precision medicine is we can maybe tell which patients who need treatment and we better be able to tell which patients that need treatment because these drugs can be very expensive. We are getting better to tell us which patients will drive a benefit from therapies. And just as importantly, we are betting getting better at telling which patients don't need therapy by identifying and linking the right tumor to the right drug. But what we are missing right now is what about not just looking at the tumor, but looking at the host, looking at the patient, looking at that person. How do we better integrate that and maybe we should not be looking at the drugs, 
maybe we should be looking at the host to see how we can get the host to attack the cancer cell. Now, how would that be? That is immune therapy. So immune therapy is the following, and this is probably the biggest scientific advance that's been recognized over the last two years. Here's the concept. So you have the cancer cells. Our immune system is supposed to be very smart. They're supposed to circle it around and say, you don't look the same. You're a 97% alien. We need to target you. You don't, just, you don't belong here. You don't belong here, and that includes the cancer cells. You don't belong here. We're going to attack you so that you go into the garbage and you don't disturb us in any way. Well, the cancer cells are very smart. They say, well, you are going to attack me, but I'm going to hide from you. I'm going to put this cloak over me so that you are not able to see me, and they basically avoid immune surveillance. So these immune cells are floating around, and they say, well, we don't see anything dangerous. Meantime, these cancer cells are hiding away. So what the scientists have learned is they have learned how these cancer cells hide away. They have learned how and why this process takes place. And it, it takes place through this process which is called checkpoint, which is our way, our own immune system's way of preventing us from getting attacked by our own immune cells. Well, the cancer cells have hijacked the system and used that for their own advantage. So the immune cells are not able to recognize it. Now we have drugs which are called checkpoint inhibitors used in melanoma, renal cell, lung cancer, which was just approved um, two weeks ago, and we just opened a clinical trial for breast cancer um, just this past week to see if we can attack this ability for cancer cells to hide away so the immune cells are able to attack the cancer cells. It's not just about introducing a new drug, it's introducing and activating our own immune cells. But this comes back to the cycle that we started off with. We started characterizing the tumor biology, we started developing targeted therapies, we started individualizing our treatment, but what if we go the other way? What if we start looking at the patient and seeing how we can use the patient itself to attack the cancer cells? And that is precision medicine, and that's what we've learned in breast cancer. Thank you.